but the fun is only beginning. Please welcome to the stage, New York Times best-selling author, author of the eventual trilogy of the King Killer Chronicles, and the most magnificent beard in the room by a factor of seven or more. Please welcome our very good friend, Patrick Rothfuss. Since I horrify most women, 
I decided to buy an animal that was required to love me or face starvation. <laughs> a pet, in other words. So I bought two guinea pigs and an aquarium. I called them Mr. Fluffins and Squeaky Pete. They were teddy bear short hairs, cute as buttons. How did I deal with the dorm rule against pets? Simple. I ignored him. <laughs> this worked for about two months until my RA saw them. He told me I'd have to get rid of them, and I agreed. Then I got back to ignoring the rule. <laughs> this worked pretty well for another month until he saw them again. Now we've got a little bit of script-style dialogue here. Him. You said you were going to get rid of those. Me. Get rid of what? Him. Those. Oh, I got rid of the old ones. Those are new ones. <laughs> Him, you can't have any pets but fish. Me, they aren't pets, they're food. I'm fattening them up. Him, listen, there are rules. Me, in Thoreau's concept of civil disobedience, it's every citizen's duty to oppose unjust laws. Him, I'm getting the hall director. So about ten minutes later, the hall director comes in. He says, you can't have pets in the dorms. It says right in the handbook. Me, except for fish. Him, right, except fish. Me, those are fish. <laughs> Him, those are guinea pigs. Me, prove it. <laughs> so he leaves and he comes back with a dictionary and says, here, fish, an aquatic animal. Me, they're aquatic. Him, Prove it. <laughs> so I leave and I come back carrying my neighbor's 10 gallon aquarium. It's full of water, plastic plants, and several confused neon tetras named after the various stooges. Now, at this point, you should know something. Squeaky Pete was everything you could want in a guinea pig. It's loving, cuddly, playful. Mr. Fluffins, however, was standoffish. He would occasionally give me this snobby look, as if he really didn't approve of my behavior. A few days ago, he and I had had a talk about how he might more willingly embrace the role of loving pet. At the end of the talk, I thought we were in agreement, but when I picked him up afterward, he made wee on my hand. So, with my hall director sitting there, I picked up Mr. Fluffins, dusted the cedar chips off, and dropped him in the aquarium. He squeaked a little and then started to swim. Then the hall director said, aquatic means they live underwater. Swimming around doesn't count. So, turning to look my hall director in the eye, I took Mr. F Fluffins in a firm grip and pushed him underwater. <laughs> Sweet mother of fuck, he shouted. What are you doing? I'm showing you my fish. <laughs> I said calmly, still looking him in the eye. <laughs> Mr. Fluffins and the Stooges started some improv comedy that lasted for five seconds, ten seconds, fifteen seconds. I didn't look away from the hall director. His eyes were huge and he was sweating. I didn't blink. Fine, it's a fish, he said. I pulled Mr. Fluffins out of the tank, squeezed him out, then wrapped him in a towel and put him on my roommate's bed in case he decided to puke. <laughs> and after that, pet me, the hall director never gave me any trouble at all. <laughs> Best of all, Mr. Fluffins became the perfect pet. <laughs> For about three weeks, and then he tried to shiv me in my sleep. <laughs> after that, we had another talk, during which he made we on my hand yet again. So I killed him, ate him, and made his skin into a little hat that I wear to this day. <laughs> yeah, that's showing up on the internet. Dear Twitter, and PETA. <laughs> Amber Alert at Patrick Ruffus. <laughs> it's probably not an Amber Alert for animal abuses there. <laughs> okay, I tell, I'll tell you the truth. I'm like spooked about this Ari story. 
because stories are kind of supposed to do certain things. Like, and this story doesn't do any of those things. I like it, and the people I've given it to, they like it, my editor likes it. But I'm still like really aware. It's like if you built a car and it was great, and everyone thought it was cool and it went somewhere, but then like you looked at it objectively and you're like, or objectively and you're like, God, this should really have some wheels somewhere <laughs> on it. There's no wheels. And everyone's like, but you know, it gets where you're going. I'm like, yeah, but there's no wheels. <laughs> What's adding to my uh, anxiety is that in a moment of like manic excitement, I said, well, it wasn't really manic excitement. It was, Envy of Neil Gaiman, who reads his own audiobooks. I said, I wish I could read this. I could do the audiobook for the Ari story. And they're like, oh, sure, that's a cool idea. Which is not, they're supposed to control me, right? <laughs> they're supposed to, like, rein in these disruptive impulses. They're supposed to handle my artistic temperament and keep me from getting myself in trouble. So now I'm reading this on the audiobook. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm really selling it, aren't I? I'm, I'm also writing an author's note that's going to go right at the beginning that says, don't buy this, it's too weird. I'm serious. Like, I've talked to my editor about it. She's delighted. She's delighted, yeah. So, uh, have I talked this up enough? Yeah, are you ready for it now? Actually, I realized this is the wrong place to read this because for those of you that have no freaking idea who I am, this is the worst introduction to my writing ever. <laughs> I'm going to put that in the foreword to this book. Please, if you don't know who I am, don't read this book. Don't buy this book. Please, just put it down and walk away. If you're curious about me, don't start here. I still have to read it though, don't I? Okay, uh, this will be the first scene of The Slow Regard of Silent Things. And the first chapter is called The Far Below Bottom of Things. <laughs> when Ari woke, she knew that she had seven days. Yes, she was quite sure of it. He would come for a visit on the seventh day. A long time. Long for waiting, but not so long for everything that needed to be done. Not if she were careful, not if she wanted to be ready. Opening her eyes, Ari saw a whisper of dim light, a rare thing as she was tucked tidily away in mantle, her privatest of places. It was a white day then, a deep day, a finding day. She smiled, excitement fizzing in her chest. There was just enough light to see the pale shape of her arm as her fingers found the dropper bottle on her bed shelf. She unscrewed it and let a single drip fall onto Foxen's dish. After a moment, he slowly brightened into a faint gloaming blue. Moving carefully, Ari pushed back her blanket so it wouldn't touch the floor. She slipped out of bed, the stone floor warm beneath her feet. The table near her bed held a basin and a sliver of her sweetest soap. None of it had changed in the night. That was good. Ari squeezed another drop directly onto Foxen. She hesitated, then grinned and let a third drop fall. No half measures on a finding day. She gathered up her blanket then, folding and folding it up, carefully tucking it under her chin to keep it from blushing, brushing against the floor. Foxen's light continued to swell, First, he was merely a fleck of light, a distant star. Then more of him began to iridesce until he had grown firefly bright. Eventually, he grew all over tremulant with light. He sat in his dish, looking for all the world like a blue-green ember slightly larger than a coin. She smiled at him while he roused himself, until finally he filled all of mantle with his truest, brightest blue-white light. Then Ari looked around. She saw her perfect bed, just her size, just so. She checked her sitting chair, her cedar box, her tiny silver cup. The fireplace was empty. Just above that was the mantelpiece, her yellow leaf, her box of stone, 
her gray glass jar with sweet dried lavender inside. Nothing was nothing else. Nothing was anything it shouldn't be. There were three ways out of mantle. There was a hallway and a doorway and a door. The last of these was not for her. Ari took the doorway into port. Foxen was still resting in his dish, so his light was dimmer there, but she could still, but it was still bright enough for her to see. Port had not been very busy of late, but even so, Ari checked on everything in turn. The wine rack held half a broken plate of porcelain, no thicker than the petal of a flower. Below that was a leather quarto book, a pair of corks, a tiny ball of twine. Off to one side, his fine white teacup waited for him with a patience that Ari envied. On the wall, on the wall shelf, sat a blob of yellow resin in a dish. There was a black rock. There was a gray stone. There was a smooth, flat piece of wood. Apart from all the rest, a tiny bottle stood, its mouth open like a hungry bird. On the central table, a handful of hollyberry rested on a clean white cloth. Ari eyed this for a moment, then carried it to the bookshelf. She looked around the room and nodded to herself. All good. Back in mantle, Ari washed her face and hands and feet. She slipped out of her nightshirt and folded it into her cedar box. She stretched happily, lifting up her arms and rolling high onto her toes. Then she ducked into her favorite dress, the one he'd given her. It was sweet against her skin. Her name was burning like a fire inside her. Today was going to be a busy day. Can we cut to the uh, computer feed here? There we go. Uh, people that know my regular book writing, uh, a lot of times don't know that I've written a couple picture books uh, called uh, The Adventures of the Princess and Mr. Whiffle, uh, illustrated uh, by Nate Taylor, who is actually here at the con uh, as a special treat, uh, who's signing in the Mysterious Galaxy booth, and we've got some of the books here. Um, now, because you're, I'm probably not the sort of person you would expect to write, a picture book, I figure I'll give you a taste here so you don't accidentally read this to a child. <laughs> Can we bring the house lights all the way down so it's dark in here? There we go. Can we bring the audience lights down too? <laughs> I'm serious. Let's, I mean, this is story time. This happens in the dark. Do they have power over that backstage? Probably not. They're shaking their heads furiously, I can tell. Okay. Once upon a time, there was a princess who lived in a Marzaban castle. She lived there all alone. Except for Mr. Whiffle, who didn't count because he was only a teddy bear, and the thing under the bed. Mr. Whiffle was the princess's best friend. They spent all their time together and had many fabulous adventures. Oh, I've got a screen over here, too. <laughs> they found buried treasure by the old stump. They defeated the Black Duke's rebellion at the Battle of Bainbridge. Victory came at a great price. The princess was sore wounded, and Sir Whiffle was forced to take terrible revenge. They fought Greenbeard the Pirate, and defeated him. Though in the heat of battle, Mr. Whiffle was nearly drowned and was only saved due to the princess's quick thinking. But when her daytime adventures were over, the princess always returned to her marzipan castle. After she had dinner and washed her face, she and Mr. Whiffle went to bed. But they were 
not alone. No, 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 down. <laughs> this is perfect timing, right? Much darker. The princess had never seen the thing under the bed because it didn't like the lights. During the daytime, when the bright sun was out, it hid in the deep shadows under the bed. It even hid at night when the lamps were lit. That's why the princess always kept a candle burning. But some nights, when it was stormy out, there were drafts in her room. And then the thing didn't need to hide anymore. The princess had never seen the thing, but she knew what it was like. It had great wide eyes that could see in the dark, and a great wide mouth for tasting things. It had thin, flat lips, and a wide, flat tongue. Its skin was greenish, grayish, brownish. The princess thought that it was prickly like a nettle, or scaly like a fish or slimy like a frog, but it was actually soft, like velvet, so the thing never made any noise at all when it moved. The princess knew it had great big hands with great long fingers, and its long, long arms had an extra elbow so it could reach out from under the bed, reach up, then bend to reach the top of the bed. Isn't this your every fear as a <laughs> child, right? And tickle the princess silly. Oh. No, 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 no. We're not done. You know me. One day, a package arrived for the princess. The princess loved the kitten. She and Mr. Whiffle spent a long time trying to decide what his name should be. The princess wanted to call him Mr. Muttonchop because of how he smelled. Mr. Whiffle wanted to call him Marlock <laughs> because of his pointy, pointy claws. They compromised by calling him M.M. or Emmy for short. But then Emmy got lost. He wasn't in their treasure mine or the old cave. Mr. Whiffle suggested they look in the river, but Emmy wasn't there either. They knew he couldn't get over the wall or past the gate. They looked everywhere. but they still hadn't found Emmy by dinner time. That night, the princess couldn't sleep. Thinking about her lost kitten made her tummy hurt. Even worse, her candle was short, and the night was long, and her tummy hurt. Then the princess heard a noise from under the bed. She knew it couldn't be the thing because it never made any noise at all, except sometimes for a soft, velvety rustle. The noise sounded familiar to the princess. It was like the sound an animal would make if it wanted to cry out, but it was muffled and quiet. Then the noise stopped, and the princess heard a soft, velvety sound, like something was reaching and bending reaching and bending. Then something wet and warm fell onto her face. Drip, drip, drip. Then Mother Moon came out from behind a cloud, and the princess saw what the thing was holding. <laughs> It 
was a big piece of marzipan. <laughs> it was sticky and drippy because the thing had been eating it. He wanted to share and be friends. He was already friends with Emmy. They had been playing under the bed all day. <laughs> Emmy had been trying to call to the princess, but she couldn't. She'd been eating marzipan with the thing, and her little kitten mouth was all gummed up. When she tried to kneel, it came out. <laughs> but now they were together again. And now that the princess had met the thing, she wasn't scared anymore. And so the princess ate them. <laughs> Soak it in. <laughs> and there was nothing left but sticky bones. So she and Mr. Wiffle made a fort out of them. <laughs> and had tea. believe in that, right? That's crap storytelling. This is a story that you have screwed yourself with. I have been telling one story from the beginning, and your expectations of the story are really what have led you astray. This isn't my fault. I view this book as a, uh, a punishment for inattentive parents. <laughs> Actually, I got a golden foil sticker that says, this shit is not for kids. <laughs> and it's got Mr. Whiffle leaning into the frame with his cold, dead eyes staring out. It says, this shit is not for kids. Seriously. But it looks like a Caldecott medal, right? <laughs> And so people are like, oh, it's a princess, oh, it's a teddy bear, oh, it's a Caldecott something, I'll give this to my kid. And actually, you know, I can tell a story about Scalzi. When uh, this was getting published through, uh, through Subterranean Press, they sent a copy to his house. <laughs> because, you know, they, they're like, hey, if you like this, maybe you, know, you could make some noise about it. And so, you know, the package shows up, his wife opens it, is like, huh, sets it down. His daughter comes in, picks it up, sits down, reads the book, and then goes in to the kitchen where mom is and is like, Mom, mom I don't like this book. <laughs> She's like, well, why not, honey? Well, she eats the kitten. <laughs> She's like, what? <laughs> so they sit down, and you know, it's good momming, right? You sit down, you they read the book together, and and you know, and they kind of unpack it, they talk about it, and then she digs the book, right? First shock, and then like deep affection, and apparently takes then decides to take the book to school. <laughs> So takes the book to school and give them, because you can bring in books that your teacher will read during story time, right? And so give it to the teacher, and now the teacher gets full points. Because the teacher actually does her job and reads the book, and then you know, says, you know, I, I don't think we can use this for story time. She says, well, why not? He says, well, because she eats the kid. <laughs> and apparently, and this, all of this is reportedly, right? I heard this story, and she goes, I'm really disappointed in you, Mrs. Nelson. And, you know, and I'm like, that is, that is what I would expect from the proper child of a geek, right? <laughs> 
And see, I really, I never meant for this to be a story that kids would like or be exposed to, but kids actually dig it, you know? Especially geek kids. I thought this was fringy or niche, and like people love reading it to their kids. I read it to my little boy, although admittedly only up to the first ending. <laughs> the, the tickle ending, right? That's just a good time. Although he's probably old enough, I think he would enjoy the rest of it. I'm waiting because I want to get it on film. <laughs> but just, I would like to say this is not a cheap twist ending. Because it's just a book that you, you didn't read the right way. Once upon a time, there was a princess who lived in a Mars Van Castle. She lived there all alone. Except for Mr. Whiffle, right, and the thing under the bed. Fabulous adventures. Oh. Oh. The princess was forced to take terrible revenge. I told you. Well, we go through, and you get, and it's fair that you maybe made a mistake because this has all the tropes of a classic children's story. There's repetition, there's some cutesiness, there's a Mars Van Castle. <laughs> Dude is legging it. <laughs> and you know, probably with good reason. Because if you look at his gear, yeah. What should his name be? This is the uh, what I consider the Mrs. Moo subplot right there. You see, she was one of the Black Duke's uh, uh, people, and now she appears in the background, uh, has her own little storyline. The princess wanted to call him Mr. Mutton Chop because of how he smelled. Oh. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff I'm not even... You know, I, I will read this. They, they don't invite me to talk at high schools anymore. <laughs> but uh, when, when I did, I would show it. And as anyone who's been uh, like a student or been a teacher especially, you know, even if somebody whispers, you can hear it at the front of the room. So I read this book, and it's all there for you. It's just a matter of like, when are you going to be forced to acknowledge that this might not be the story you thought it was at the beginning? And I had, I was reading this in a high school, and at this point, somebody was turning over and whispered to their friends, there's a lot of bones in this book. <laughs> and I'm like, good for you. Good for you. It's like, I want you running the country, you know, later on. I like you paying attention. Now here, you've got to just be willfully ignoring what's going on in this story. This is not my fault. I knew we couldn't get over the wall. I still haven't found Emmy by dinner time. <laughs> and her tummy hurt. Thinking about her lost kitten made her tummy hurt. See? <laughs> I would not do you the disservice of telling you a story and putting in some cheap twist ending, right? However, I would happily let you mislead yourself <laughs> and actually be telling you a story that you might be reading in a way that is not maybe the best way to read the story. <laughs> this is something that might happen in a lot of my work. Okay, we on the same page here? Do I have to give you any more footnotes or subtext? Yeah, 
And now we'll just leave Mr. Whiffle staring at us here at the very end. <laughs> when I close my eyes at night, that's what I see. <laughs> So, uh, that is pretty much my time. And so now I think the rest of the crew is going to come out and we will do one last song to send you all home. Good. And it was right on the dot. I'd never hit that time so hard before. Good for you, Pat. And then, hey, it's a deadline, right? <laughs> I'm practicing. <laughs> this is the third. <laughs> Come on over and join us. Pat Rothfuss, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah! How y'all doing out there? You still holding up okay? That's right, it's early in the con and you all still smell good. <laughs> We have all our guests coming. We have, we have a guest mic. You guys can hear. Whatever you grab some of Three on a microphone, that's good luck. <laughs> Excuse me. An hour performance for my stomach. Okay. <laughs> Alright. It is 10.30 at night. <laughs> on a Friday night, early in the con, everybody is still reasonably hygienic, it smells okay. Dewy fresh. 10.30, you know what that is? What is that, Paul? That is time for a song about pirates! <laughs> uh, 10.30 p.m. be the pirating hour. That's right. We, uh, this does involve some audience participation. When we cue you, and only when we cue you. Car. <laughs> Mutinous punch. <laughs> when we cue you, let forth with a big, loud, piratical R. Practice it now! R! Hits us two times! R! R! Hits us five times! R! Most of you have been studying up for this night. Thank you. <laughs> How would you study up? <laughs> Just look at a page that has a big letter R on it? <laughs> Just deep the pie. I will admit to looking up a few pirate puns. I, you know, I, I'll, I'll cop to that. I'm not proud of it. <laughs> Own it. Own it. That's right. It's totally cool. Wow, this is, this is maybe the largest uh, ensemble, largest, largest pirate crew we've ever had on stage for this song. Hopefully we don't capsize. Okay. <laughs> Practice one more time. <laughs> Thank you again for coming out. We are Paul and Storm and John Scalzi and Pat Rothfuss. And crew. And the rest. <laughs> 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 uh, practice yet one more final time. Arr! This last song is called The Captain's Wife's Lament. We're all doing right here, so. <laughs> the ship sailed into harbor after 15 months. It's, this is my time to shine. Shut up, Scalzi. <laughs> Uh, or, do you, or do you want to talk about your Hugo some more? Uh, you mean my three Hugos? <laughs> Someone's Bogart in the spotlight. <laughs> Points. Once he was but a learner, now he is the master. Darth <laughs> Vader. You haven't seen the you haven't seen the Darth Vader mask with a really big bushy beard under it. That's that's some that's some cosplay I'm waiting to see happen. <laughs> I'm really not. I I'm so Darth Rothfuss. <laughs> no, he was in the Empire at Strike Back, I think. 
Marzipan castle. <laughs> he lived all alone but for his terrible pugs. <laughs> and because of his terrible pugs. <laughs> How are we doing, Sean and Amber? <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the wise strategy. Stay quiet and thumbs up. <laughs> um, have we started the song? Have we even started the song yet? No. 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 no, we should get to that. But Give me that chord again. It's over. So it's it's it. starting the... <laughs> I'm, I'm here. We're never leaving. <laughs> I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm here, we're never leaving is my Grateful Dead cover band. <laughs> or fish, take your choice. <laughs> Practice yet one more final time. Uh, Ship sailed into harbor after 15 months at sea. The captain hit the tavern with his crew of 53. That's you. Give me an R. What's that spell? Yeah, pretty much. We would also accept. Tonight's show is brought to you by the legend. See, that's some smart thinking. That's, like, that's my whole cover band. Do you have these written down on your iPad? No, I have the damn lyrics on my iPad. The battery's like at 15%. Oh, the same. Oh, we don't sing the song. You're taking the wrong approach, man. <laughs> Yoda is kind of more Grover tonight. <laughs> oh, you see Grover. Sometimes Grover isn't here. Sometimes Grover is far. <laughs> It's like they say now that dogs are attuned to the magnetic 
Spears? Is that right? Spears? Spears. 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 Paying attention now. Apparently, sad, head, <laughs> sad heads tilt to star. <laughs> Which is my Morrissey kind of way. Fuck you, that was great. <laughs> No one was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> wow, our work here is done. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be able to identify each other through the con. It's uh... <laughs> at 10:39 on Friday, June 6. The audience became self-aware. <laughs> <laughs> Judgment Day, they called it. Uh, Terminator. <laughs> Are you Sarah Connor? <laughs> Just like he said in the movie. <laughs> Someday I'll be governor <laughs> of California. <laughs> we are never leaving this stage, are we? <laughs> no, don't woo that. <laughs> don't woo that is my Justin Bieber company. <laughs> Power. You sure showed him, yeah. With your Take that, Dave, and your money. <laughs> you feel bad, man. Bunch of nerds in Phoenix make fun of you. <laughs> <laughs> Dejected R was where we left off. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great to watch. You don't usually get to see it from this angle. It's like the wind over wheat. <laughs> Book four of the trilogy, oh, right? Copyright, copyright. <laughs> Wind over wheat. I could do that as a children's book. Uh, it would be about farts. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. no Princess no. lived in a Mars of <laughs> Yes. No, no, I'm writing it. No, I'm writing it. <laughs> you done boys the well. Yeah. It's like gristle in my teeth right now. It's like, I'm on page five, yeah, it's the, the illustration, yeah. We'll be, uh, we'll be having that flash printed. It should be available by Sunday <laughs> at Pat's booth. <laughs> wow. That was, that was the thing that just happens. <laughs> yeah, one, one more thing to prevent you from writing the Yeah, I know. Now I, get, now I get to shuffle some of it off onto you. There we go. <laughs> yeah, it's our fault. Make sure to tell Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so, once again, we left off at Dejected. Have you guys ever done this in Australia? <laughs> yeah, they told me the other way. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the car reel is a <laughs> Down under. Sean <laughs> <laughs> is just very quietly getting in good ones. <laughs> just sniping from the back. <laughs> Get up on the mic and proudly say those shitty puns. That's how this works. That's how this game works. Between me and the money. I'm standing over to the side. I know what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> how about you, Empire? <laughs> Step up to the mic. I got nothing. My mom babysat one of her friends' kids. That's all I got. No shit. <laughs> that, was, that wasn't an our pan, but that was a fact. <laughs> I'm not funny. That's really funny. That's my other Paul and Storm cover band. <laughs> <laughs> Third time is the charm. Dejected up. <sighs> Fourth time? Well, well, the third time is still the charm. I would like to point out 1042, we have some four fucking lines in this song. <laughs> four fucking lines is my Fleetwood Mac comes <laughs> out. Sort of visual, visual. Flawless dismount. Dejected R. Uh, captain said, fear not me lads, you all can come with me. I live just around the corner, and you all can stay for free, hopeful are. What kind of socks do you like best? Oh. 
Muppets over here. Just, <laughs> <laughs> a little Muppet choir. Why do we always come here? I guess we'll never know. It's like a kind of torture to have to watch the show. Muppet dance. <laughs> That is an animated chip that needs to go on the internet before the end of this song. And that's how I met my wife. <laughs> Alright, we're going to count to three. You will do one more R. We will finish this goddamn song. Why <laughs> am I am Spartacus! Spar, Spartacus. Okay, shh, shh. Deep cleansing breath. It out. <laughs> We're gonna let you have that one. That's, to, that's a free. One. To be fair, we did walk into that one. But I got my eye on you now, Rockness. <laughs> Just wanted to see that shot on the TV and all these people. You smell lovely. Gee, your hair smells too. <laughs> It's like cinnamon and Xbox. Smells <laughs> <was> like ginger. <laughs> Lavender, actually. Conditioner. <laughs> Barbasol. Barbershave. <laughs> Thank you for the Barbershave reference. That was just for me. That was just for you. Not all of this show is for you people. <laughs> That's very little of it. Our other other Poland Stone cover band. Okay. Ten fifty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Timekeeper. <laughs> With your chronometer. <laughs> Are you people ready? <laughs> Are you people ready? What's the circumference of a circle divided by pi? R. Try again. Who's your favorite uh, bearded fantasy author not standing on this stage? We both just sound an R R R R. I think we've lost sentience out there. It's just the audience bad is no dogs. We are safe. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of good puns that we can also say, <laughs> but at some point I have to go to bed. <laughs> So that, yeah, okay, you know what, everyone just shout random R shit for the next three seconds. Get it out. Yeah, that was good. Okay, feel better? Cathartic. <laughs> uh, I can do this all night. I am so caffeined right now. We are never going home. Pajama party. <laughs> Slumber. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. If we are quite, quite ready to shut the fuck up at this point. <laughs> you started it. I did, that's the worst part. I'm responsible, I'm patient zero. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> You all just have to fill in that blank on your own. All right. Once again, are you ready? Are you guys ready? <laughs> are you ready, Storm? Yes. I don't even have to fucking ask. All right, let's do this. One, two, three. She said there is semen all around the bed and semen on the floor. Semen in the bathroom and behind the closet door. There is semen in the fireplace. Semen in the hall. The living room. Seen it wall to wall. There's seen it in the entryway, seen it on the stair, and worst of all, there's even seen it in the underwear. There's some behind the larder and beneath the table too. I do believe you see it got to do me Irish too. There's seen it here in front of me, seen it in the rear. My God, there's even seen it hanging from the chandelier. There's seen it on the windowsill, seen it in the yard. The semen even left a staple from the St. Bernard. Although I am a patient, life is more than I can bear to wake up in the morning with your semen in my hand. Disgusted R. If you 
excited hearts. <laughs> it is a Comic Con after all. <laughs> I, Derek, and do wish to see the dark. 